Yes, there is. Woo! Who said, who said Danish people are quiet? Who said Danish people are reserved? Who said Danish young adults like to keep hidden? Hey, welcome to Brighter. May you take your seats tonight. It's awesome to be here. And uh, it's such an honor and privilege for me to be with you guys. This is the second time I have preached on this platform in this, whatever it is. I don't know. This could be a, this could be a counter-terrorism unit. How many of you used to watch 24? Did you ever used to watch, did that make it over here? Yeah, probably did. Jack Bauer. I feel like, I feel like people are just going to, something's going to happen in here tonight. And Jack's going to come from the roof and do something. I'm excited about that. But I'm excited about being here with you. And uh, thank you for coming from wherever you've come from to be here tonight. Has anyone come further than like three hours away to be here tonight? Wow. Four hours, five hours, six hours, six hours. Yeah, where have you come from? Beautiful place. Fantastic. Anyone come from a different country to be here tonight other than me and Tom? Wow, where are you girls from? Norway. Norway. Wow. The Danish just applauded the Norwegians. They stole your oil. And you're applauding the Norwegians. Hey, it's great for you to be here. Pardon? It's French. The, the oil belongs to France? I'm confused. Can someone, can someone trans... Are you confused? I'm confused. Anyway, it's great to be here tonight. I've come uh, with uh, Tom Lancaster, and we've come from uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, Royal Britannia. Britannia rules the waves, which is the name of one of our songs that we sing in church. And... Um, my name's Dave, and like uh, John said, I have the privilege of leading Rock Nations, and that's an, uh, an amazing thing, a movement that we've been able to be a part of, and I see a few Got the Vibe t-shirts in this room tonight, and that was part of our conference in August, uh, but it's great to be with you tonight, and over the next 24 hours, we're going to have a good time, and I'm going to take you on a little journey on different things, and I know you've had uh, another Englishman speaking here, an older, wiser, better-looking, taller, stronger Englishman called Peter Reed who's been with you, and uh, he's deep, okay? And I'm going to try and be as deep as him, but I probably won't work. But he's an intelligent man, and uh, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey over the next 24 hours and try and help you guys. You know, as a, as a, I've been a youth pastor for quite a few years now, and I also lead a, a campus, one of our campuses in the city of Leeds in, in England. And uh, we're good at often, you know, often having a great party and making, Wah! shouting and doing, making lots of noise. But we also want to impart some wisdom into your life. Because the reality is when things come your way, when storms hit your life, yes, you can clap and yes, you can sing with everything at the top of your voice is good. But you also need some word of God inside your soul to help you navigate through some stuff. And uh, tonight I want to help you uh, with that a little bit. Is that cool? So we're going to get straight into it tonight, and I like a bit of interaction. I don't know if you have interaction in Denmark, but when I speak, you go, amen. When I speak, you go, mm, I like that. When I speak, you stand up, you run around, woo, and you can, you can do what you want, okay? Just pretend you're in like an African church tonight, and uh, do, what you, do what you want, you know? If you, want to put, if you want to put money on the platform, you can put money. We'll send it to A21. This is, this is no rules here tonight, okay? It's just free to be you. Um, turn to John chapter 8 if you have a Bible. I was asking Jesper before the service. Don't you love Jesper Jesperson? Don't you love Jesper Jesperson? Not only is Jesper Jesperson an amazing man of God, he also has the best name in the world. <laughs> when people are saying, where are you going? I'm going to go and see Jesper Jesperson. They laugh. They go, <laughs> is that a real person? And I'm like, yes, it is. And um, when I was chatting to Jesper just before the service, um, I said, you know, do you need to put the scriptures on the screen? He goes, no, 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 no. It forces people to bring their Bibles. It forces people to go on their iPhones. And so go on your iPhones, turn Facebook off, turn Twitter off, turn Instagram off. Don't worry, the social media life will live on without you for 35 minutes. And uh, turn to John chapter 8, reading from verse, verse 
Three. Are you there? If you're not there, I'm going anyway. It says the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, okay, they're usually the Swedish people. The Swedish people brought in a, not really, the teachers of the law, I don't want to be racist tonight. Okay, we, want to be, we don't want to be prejudiced towards any nation. But England are going to the World Cup. But the <laughs> teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, just stop there. For a woman to be caught in the act of adultery, how many of you know there needs to be a guy also caught in the act of adultery? Do you understand what I mean? Do I need to go there? You understand? It's interesting in it how they make a spectacle of the woman but ignore the man. There's nothing to do with my message. That's just a contextual socialite thought that I have from that phrase. But it says, in the law, Moses commanded to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, which basically means he got up, and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote, on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first. Why? Because the older, the olders, the older ones are wiser than the younger ones. Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, he, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. What an amazing passage of scripture. That story is more than 2,000 years old and it still gives me goosebumps when I hear the story. Because when I think about the story, I'm thinking, imagine that was in church and a lady was brought in our church midweek. She was sat down on a chair and brought in front of me and said, this lady has been caught in adultery. I don't know if I would respond how Jesus responded. And I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. I'm a 21st century believer in the Lord. And I'm not sure I would do what Jesus did. But I want to talk in this short time I have with you called a message called Lift Your Head Up. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, lift your head up. And as you do it, Lift your head up. Last year, I went to Brazil. Anybody ever been to Brazil before? La 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 bamba. That's not Brazil, that's somewhere else, but Coco Cabana and all that stuff. Brazil's an amazing country, but I was was there for about five days and I was flying back to England from Brazil and um, I was pretty tired, okay, on this flight. Hashtag you know, first world problems, being in Brazil, about to get a flight, really tired. You know, it's, it's not a big problem, but it's a, what's called, we call a first world problem. It was like today, I was really ticked off. At, at the, well, I was ticked off at the airport, really angry at Copenhagen Airport, because the walk was so long to the next terminal to get my flight to Aarhus. And I turned to Tom and went, hashtag first world problem. <laughs> I'm annoyed at the length of the walk from one terminal to another terminal to get a flight to meet with amazing people. Anyway, moving on from that. I was coming home, and this flight was long, and I got... I went and went to check in uh, on the plane. I said, can I have an aisle seat, please? Because if you've ever been on a plane before, I like to, you know, be the aisle. I don't want to be by the window. Because if you're by the window, you end up, like, getting, like, squashed. And for, like, 11 hours, you know, like, what's, um, what's the worship leader's name? The one who needed a toilet break during worship? Matthias. I'm like Matthias. Like, Matthias is like a little boy. He needs to go to the toilet, like, all the time. <laughs> is Matthias here now? He's probably in the toilet somewhere. Like he had, had some like orange squash before the meeting and oh, I need to go again. Well, I'm like that on a plane. I need to go to the toilet. So I don't want to be by a window. Okay, I want to be by the aisle. I've got a bit more space. Everybody say space. space. 
So I request the seat. I go onto the plane. I look at my ticket. And I realize she's given me the wrong seat. She misheard me. She's given me a window seat. <laughs> Hashtag first world problem. And as I'm sat there, there's an empty seat there, and then there's a massive six-foot-six guy who's just, like, dominating the seat on the aisle. I'm not even going to ask him if he wants to swap. He can have it, okay? But I'm thinking, as long as this is okay, we've got one seat here. We can share this seat. I'll put my bag there. You put your bag there. We can share the seat. In fact, we could have half, and, half a seat for our elbows, and we could, you know, look at each other and go, this is, this is, we can share this seat. Then if we go to sleep, you know, I can have my head, here he's back from the toilet, here he is. Was that, was that, you been to the toilet again, Matthias, yeah? <laughs> he's, he's back. Stop drinking water, okay? Just stop it. You'll be back up here in half an hour. Anyway, so we're there and everything's cool. And I think as long, as long as no one comes and sits in this seat, we'll be fine. Just as we're about to, you know, start taxing down the, around the, on the runway, this guy comes from the, from the curtain. I see him coming towards me. I'm thinking, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Please don't be sat in this middle seat. Otherwise, for 11 hours, I'm going to be jammed in this tight, crammed up, claustrophobic little space, and I'm not going to be able to get out. And this guy's massive, okay? He's like a tank. He's like... Three sizes of me, all right, he's here, big leather jacket, and he's walking down, and he stops at our row, looks at me in the eye, and he goes like this, I am your worst nightmare. <laughs> and I'm there going, yes, you are. <laughs> and he plonks himself right in the middle seat, moves my elbow out the way, moves the other guy's elbow out of the way, and just sits there like this. And I'm there, cramped up head against the window, thinking, I can't do this for 11 hours. I get a chance to this guy. I find out he's an ultimate fighting championship fighter, okay? He's going to China to train people in UFC. And I'm thinking, man alive, if, if I could be on any seat on the plane, and I'm next to these two giants, two Goliaths, and here I am, David, sat next to them without a slingshot, okay? Without the faith and without the courage of David, I'm, I'm going to die in this seat. Anyway, I get chatting to him for a while, and it turns out he's a Christian. Oh, well, that's, that's cool, but I still didn't want you to sit here. Um, you know, and he, anyway, we're about to take off, and he, he holds my hand. He goes, David, let me hold your hand. And he goes like this, he goes, he goes, let's pray. He goes, Father, we are coming Closer to you. <laughs> As we take off, what the best prayer ever. Anyway, then we like stop holding hands like three guys, <laughs> strangers, never met before, and we're all holding hands in a row. It's like, this is weird. We take off and we're flying in the air. An hour into this thing, I'm like, already my neck, so I need to go to the toilet. I'm like, I cannot do this for 11 hours. And so what I decided to do at that point I decided to get up from my seat and look for something better. I decided to get up literally out of my seat and walk around the plane and look for a better seat. And I want to say to you tonight, some of you have settled for life how it is. Some of you have settled for the seat that you have been given or that you have created for yourself when in fact you could leave your seat and you could go and look for something better. Now I couldn't find any other seat in the, in the whole plane except one seat. It was on the edge of what we call premium, premium economy. There was leg space. There was just one person over there. I could put arms out and legs out and I was thinking, that's my seat. <laughs> But I've not paid for that seat. And I've not requested that seat. Who cares? I'm going to sit in that seat. So I sat in the seat. I put a blanket over my head. And I pretended to... I look in the corner of my eye. And the lady who I'm sat next to open her eye thinking, who on earth is this person? Who is this person who's just snuck up on me and has sat in a seat that they're not supposed to be on? Anyway, I, a few hours later, I... Uh, arrive back in the UK and I hear, I'll get woken up by the pilot saying we're going to land in 30 minutes. I've been asleep for like 10 hours in this spacious seat, just loving life. And I go back because I'd left my bag and all my belongings at the original seat. And I go back there and as I'm heading towards the seat, my friend, my UFC fighter, stands to his feet, no lie, stands to his feet and goes, Hallelujah, you're alive. 
He thought, he, he thought I'd gone missing. He thought I'd fallen down the toilet and had like escaped out of the plane. For 10 hours, he's been wondering and praying about where I am and my safety. He thought I'd gone to the toilet and I never, ever returned. <laughs> and I told him that I'd found a better seat and we ended up landing and it was a laugh and, and all of that. Anyway, why, why do I tell you that story? Because that story is a picture of some people's lives. There is an upgrade opportunity for you and for me that you you can take hold of that you don't have to sit in the seat that you are leading sitting in the lady who's been caught in adultery she is sat in a seat and yet Jesus says there's a different seat for you you might not deserve that seat you've not done anything to deserve it you've not earned that seat but you know what because I am Jesus Christ I am going to give you that seat I know you've not paid for it I know you've not done anything to deserve it but I'm going to give you the greatest gift of all. It is called the gift of grace. Yes. And I want you guys at Brighter tonight to know that there is a gift of grace. And it is an incomparable gift. There is nothing that can compare with God's grace through Jesus Christ. And many of your lives are like G with this, like this lady. You might not have been caught in adultery. But there's stuff that has gone on in your life. And you feel like you are also on your knees with Jesus right with you on the side of the road. Because Jesus will always come down and meet you where you are at. Jesus doesn't stand above you and condemn you. Jesus comes down to your level. And Jesus is having a conversation with us right where you are tonight. And he's saying, go on with your way. Get on with your life. Don't let your past define you. Live differently. I love Jesus giving his full backing, his full support for this woman. When all support has deserted her, who is the one person left supporting her? It's Jesus Christ. You see, the Pharisees, they simply see the Pharisees with this lady, they see her performance. They see the fact that she has not performed how she should have performed. But I love Jesus sees the person. Jesus doesn't see the performance in you. Jesus sees the person in you. You see, if you live performance-based Christianity, you think it's all based on a judgmental marking system. But a grace-based Christianity uses a love-marking system where it says, I don't care, really. it doesn't really matter what you've achieved or how you've done. I love you despite all of that. Yeah. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, I haven't got time to read it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, it talks about, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. And as part of Brider, whatever church you are from, sometimes we speak so much about what we're going to do, what we're going to achieve, what we're going to build. Vision, 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 vision. And you can have so much vision. But I want you to know this tonight, which is why I'm kicking off the, the three messages I'm doing you with this, this tonight, that despite... All of that vision, despite all of the things that you can get consumed with, the grace of God towards your life is never in question. The grace of God, the love of God towards your life, for your life, is never in question. Let me put it like this. You can serve all hours. You can like get here early. You can stay here late. You can be up here. You can do all the things that you can do. You can do stuff and do stuff. And I encourage you to serve. I encourage you to get involved. But you could also do the opposite and avoid serving altogether and leave before anyone asks you, can you sweep up? Can you do this? And guess what? His grace is not in question. You could tithe. You could give money. You could be generous. You could, in fact, not be generous, not give a penny ever in the offering. You could even steal from the offering. Don't advise that, but you could. And guess what? His grace is not in question. You could walk with God intimately. You could get up at 6 a.m. every morning and spend three hours in prayer like Jesper Jesperson does. Hmm. Or you could avoid praying, you could just get up when you want, not bother reading the Bible, attend church whenever you want. And you know what? His grace is not in question. 
You could be caught in the very act of adultery. Don't you like the Bible's definition? Not just caught in adultery, caught in the very act. (laughs) It's like descriptive. The very act of adultery. And do you know what? The grace of God is not in question. Isn't that crazy? When you think about it. We could go on like, you know, how extreme, okay, we're not going to serve at church, okay, we're not going to tithe, okay, we're not going to attend church, okay, well, we're not going to tell anyone about God, okay, we're not going to read our Bible. They're sort of at this area, and then down at this end, you've got like caught in the very act of adultery. (laughs) You've got like doing some bad stuff, some serious stuff, and from there to there, the grace of God continues to flow. The grace of God is not in question. It is what separates the divinity of God and the humanity of man, that the divinity of God just has grace and has love and has unmerited favor, but the humanity of man, we do have questions, we do have conditions, we do have, uh, but you don't deserve that, (laughs) but you've not been here long enough to say that, but you, but, 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 I like big butts, (laughs) and I cannot lie. Now, this doesn't mean that God has no standards. This doesn't mean that we don't face consequences for our actions because the Bible is clear. Obedience is followed by blessing. So don't leave here thinking, oh, that's great. Dave says I don't have to do anything. I'm off to go and live the life I want to live. No, if you want the blessing of God, there's got to be obedience in your life. But the grace of God, what I want to help you understand tonight, is not a result of works. Grace is a result of Jesus. It's not the favor of man, but it's in fact all about the favor of God. And tonight, on this night where I'm first with you, I want to help you understand something really simple. And the first thing I want to help you understand tonight is how much God loves you. You. Now, now, I'm not, ignore the person you're sat next to. Ignore the people you came with and just signify this on yourself, okay? How much God loves me. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you're thinking, have I come to Brighter? Have I come all the way to Ranners? Is it Ranners? Is that how you say it? Ranners? Have I come all the way here to listen to like a guy talk about God's love? I thought that's like what we do in like, you know, like kindergarten, like in kids' school, you know, in like Sunday school. And yet you're telling me that God loves you? Yeah, I am. Because do you ever doubt yourself? Because I do. I sometimes doubt myself that I'm called to this, that I'm gifted for this, that I'm equipped for this. Not just speaking, but this, this Christian life, to be a husband, to be a father. I doubt myself all the time. Do you ever wish you were just better at doing life? It's a question you can answer. Do you ever wish you were just better at doing life? I do all the time. I sometimes look at people and I think, I wish I could live like you. You're kind. I'm not kind. You're generous. I'm not generous. I have bad thoughts. You have good thoughts. You're always there to help people. I prefer to stay at home and watch football. I wish I could be like you. I have those thoughts about myself. Do you ever just wish you were different? Ever wish you were just better, more gifted, more talented, just had a greater character? So many things that make us, make me and you strive to be better, for things to be better. But listen to me, if nothing ever improved in your life, God would still love you. If I never change, if I never go from strength to strength, if I don't increase in my wisdom or in my favor or in my gifting or in my character, if I never change, if you never change, God still loves me. God still loves you no matter what. And sometimes it's good just to stop for a moment and think about that. A few months ago, I was at the side of stage on a Friday night at one of our youth meetings and the band started singing a song. And I started thinking about how much God loved me. I'm 31 years old. I became a Christian when I was five. I remember the night so clearly, lying on my bed, asking my dad, saying, Dad, I want to become a Christian. I want to invite Jesus into my heart. And I remember him holding my hand and praying a prayer and me repeating. I, I remember it like it was like yesterday. 
And I've been a Christian a long time. I've been in church a long time. I've been, I've been doing ministry. I've been doing church for a long time. I get it. I know when you're supposed to clap. I know when you're supposed to raise your hands. I know when you're supposed to look like you're praying. I know when you're supposed to do things that you think you're supposed to do. And on this moment on the side of stage, I just started crying. I just started like weeping. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm meant to be getting up to close worship. And the band was singing a song. He loves us. Oh, he loves us. Do you know that song? Maybe not. Um, he is jealous for me. And it's like, it's a cool song. Not my favorite song in the world, but I'm thinking, he loves me. Wow. And I'd been so busy doing church, doing ministry, running stuff, organizing stuff, probably like many of you, that I'd actually forgotten the most simplest truth, that God loves me. Ephesians 2, if you want to read it, talks about because of God's great love for us. You only have to go to Romans where it talks about neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You only have to read Ephesians 3. May you have the power to grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ that this love surpasses all knowledge. You have to read the Bible where it talks about we love because he first love us and you begin to realize that he loves you that you begin to realize that Jesus actually really loves you that his love is immeasurable I know what we do we try and get our ruler out and we try and measure how much does he love me this week compared to last week but you have to throw the ruler away and you realize his love is immeasurable. And I've had 25 years of growing in God, reaching for more in God, trying to do more stuff for God, doing lots and lots of stuff. But what underpins it all is that God loves me. And because he loves me, that gives me the confidence to what I call lift your head up. Yes, I might doubt myself. Yes, I may sometimes wish I was better at stuff in my life. I wish I hadn't done some of the things I had done. I know there's people condemning me and people about to stone me, but it is the love of God through Jesus Christ, through grace, which enables me and enables you to lift your head up. You know, when you don't succeed for him, he loves you. Think about that. When you don't reach the mark... Guess what? God loves you. When you totally miss the plot. Don't know if that makes sense in Danish. He loves you. And every day I want to wake up with an increasing revelation that God loves me and there is nothing I can do to increase it. There is nothing I can do to decrease it. It's just the way it is. And there is nothing I can do about it. So I might as well receive the love of God. I can run away from it tonight. I can ignore it. I can abuse it. I can choose not to receive it. And guess what? The love is still there. You might think this is simple teaching tonight. Well, question, if it was so simple, why do so many of us live so condemned, so unloved, so insecure, so in need of love from boyfriends and girlfriends and people and friendships? Why are we so in need of all of these things if we truly knew that there was a love so so undeserved to us, but yet a love that was so overwhelming. You might be sat there waiting for stones to be thrown at you, but there is a love coming your way. And I want to help you tonight understand this and leave with a sense that, you know what, grace isn't just some prayer you say before dinner. That the grace of God isn't just some cool teaching from the United States of America, but in fact grace is an unstoppable power of love and favor directed at your life from the throne room of heaven. And it is there to change you forever. 
Because if you don't receive this gift, if I don't receive the gift of love, love, what happens is I live condemned. I live subject to the voices around me. I live subject to opinions everywhere. I live subject to my own guilt. But grace has released me from bondage. Grace has released me from captivity. Grace has released me from the seat next to the window where I feel trapped and condemned and totally pretty worthless and useless. And grace has given me a new seat on the plane. It's given me a spacious seat. And in the few minutes I have left with you, I want to talk to you a few things about this grace to, because some of you maybe have heard lots of things. Number one, his grace is undeserved. His grace is undeserved. When I was on this plane, what I went and sat in was a higher fare seat. The seat that I took, I should have paid more money for that seat. And you might be, well, you shouldn't have sat in that naughty boy. You shouldn't have sat. Hey, you're one of the Pharisees with the stones. <laughs> have, you never, have you never gone one mile over the speed limit? <laughs> We've all made mistakes. We all do things. And the seat's there. And I'm not saying go and lie and be deceitful. But the first thing that I did when I went and sat in this plane, in this seat on the plane, was I buried my head in a blanket. As soon as I got there, I got this blanket and buried my head in it. Do you know why I did that? Because I was ashamed. Because I did not deserve that seat. I did not deserve it. I hadn't paid for that seat. The seat I deserved was the seat that I'd paid for. It was the cluster, it was the crammed tight seat. But yet I sat in a seat I did not deserve. And maybe tonight... You are living life with your head in a blanket. And tonight I want to encourage you to take your blanket off, lift your head up, because we are all in the same boat. None of us, none of us are deserving of his grace, are deserving of his love. That's why Jesus says to the Pharisees, he says, which one of you is deserving? Make your voice heard. Which one of you is deserving of the grace? What he's saying is none of you, none of us are deserving of the grace. We often hear the phrase in England, and I'm sure you hear it in Denmark as well, and the phrase is this, have you heard the news? It's called that, and whenever you say it, when everyone says that, it's basically some Christian gossip they're about to give you. Come this way. So and so, let's, let's call him, let's call him um, Peter Peterson. <laughs> Peter Peterson has fallen from grace. Oh, <gasps> no, Yes. He's fallen from grace. And you're there going, oh my gosh, what has happened? What's happened? Is it a financial issue? Is it a sexual immorality issue? What has he done? What has he done to fall from this grace? And when people say that, we have come to believe that when someone falls into sin, they fall from grace. Almost like when they weren't sinning, they deserve the grace like when they weren't sinning, when they were doing the right things, they, you know, the grace was there and they deserved it. But because of something they've done, they no longer now deserve the grace. And sometimes when I have those conversations, I get a little bit confused because God wants me and God wants you to know that when someone falls into sin, he does not fall from grace, he actually falls into grace. That you're not falling out of it, you're falling into it. You're not falling out of the love of God, but you're falling into the love of God. It is the grace of God and the love of God that puts you back on your feet. This lady on her knees condemned, she's fallen into sin, but really she's fallen into the grace of God. And it is the grace of God that grabs her by the hand and lifts her back up on her feet. Thank God that his grace is there to put me, hey, and to put you back up on your feet. Because there have been times when I didn't deserve anything but stones. And there's been times when I didn't deserve anything but isolation from God, separation from God. But it is the grace of God that has put me back on the feet. Whether you're a prostitute, the tax collectors that Jesus taught with, this lady who got caught in adultery, who fell into God's grace and got put back on their feet. You see, all of them didn't deserve it. None of them were deserving of the grace, but they all received it anyway. Because when you start thinking that you deserve the grace, when you start thinking it's your right, you think it's become your right, but grace is not your right. Grace is what is putting you right. <laughs> But it is not your right. None of us 
deserve it. Listen to this verse in Romans. Do you like the Bible? Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, for all have sinned. So everybody say all. That, including you, Mr. Perfect Peter Peterson. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? That's a statement. Romans 3.23. That is a statement. That's a pretty dad. That's a like, pretty like, bad statement. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And love what comes next. And are justified freely by his grace through Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense. That, math, that equation does not add up. So we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. And because of that, we've all been justified, which basically means declared innocent. We've been set free by his grace. Grace declares you innocent. So sin and falling short equals justified. That is a false equation. God's maths are not human maths, thank God. If we were making those, if we were adding those things up, you've sinned and you've fallen short. You know what that equals? That equals you need to sit on the back row of church life. You can't get involved. You can't serve. You can't do anything. We're going to ignore you, but you just hide over there. But Jesus says, sinned, you've fallen short. Come and take a seat on the front row. Come and sit right there. Enjoy the view. Enjoy the experience. The love of God is here for you tonight. Where they're going, I don't understand this. All of us often there with our human justice and then we combine and then we meet the justice of God. We're there like justice officers and then grace enters the courtroom and turns justice into turmoil. Why? Because grace just is not fair. Even on the cross, when the thief who has done some bad things on the cross, in that last moment, in the dying breath, he doesn't deserve it. But what happens? Grace breaks in. Love reaches out a hand and rescues a man in his dying breath. It's undeserved. It's the scandal of grace. His grace is undeserved. Number two, his grace is unreserved. It's unreserved. What does that mean? It, me it knows no limits. It will keep walking past this wall, through this wall, through this city, through this nation, through this continent, and around the world. There is no end. There is no measure. His love is totally unreserved. It will fill every single thing. It is limitless. It knows no limits. Romans 5 says grace overflows. You have a cup for your grace. Grace will simply keep flowing out of it. There is an abundant provision of it. And the limit of your sin will always be surpassed by the limit of his grace. The sin will never be able to increase over the grace. The grace will always be unreserved towards him. That's why in fact Romans chapter 5 verse 29 it says, where sin increases, grace increases all the more. The city that you live in might be dark. The nation that you live in might be dark and sinful. Hey, I quite like that because that means where it's sinful, God's grace doesn't much abound. That where it's dark and where it's miserable and where there's hatred, the love of God can be most at work. You can see the power of his grace. The sin might be deep, but the grace is deeper. His grace is unreserved. Number three, his grace is life-saving. It's life saving. You're not saved. Your life is not saved through working at stuff. Your life isn't saved through filling out a connection card, through receiving a Bible and reading a Bible. Those things are good and those things will help you, but those things will not save your life. Your life is saved through grace, through faith, from your simple faith to receive a life saving gift. And it is the only life-saving power. Nothing on earth has the power or the authority to stop it because grace is the character of God. And once the character of God is in motion, nothing can change it. When I was in Brazil on this trip, I was in a session with a bunch of young adults like yourself and we had a Q&A session and someone asked a question and it's the famous Christian question. It was this, do you believe in once saved, always saved? Which basically means if someone makes a decision to be a Christian, do you believe they're always a Christian? I was like, oh, I knew this question was going to come. And as I'm giving my response, I just have this sense that if someone has received the grace of God, when they accept Jesus Christ, 
Are you telling me that there is something powerful enough, something strong enough to take away that grace that has been given by God? Are you telling me that there is a force in the world, the enemy or the devil, that has the potential, the destroying power to destroy the grace of God? No, the grace of God is life-saving. It is all-powerful. Once it is given, how can it be destroyed? It cannot be. You have been saved by the grace of God. Therefore, you can lift your head up. Number four in the final two minutes. Number four, his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Have you ever been to a supermarket to get bread, milk, and eggs? Or toilet rolls on its own? <laughs> or to get just a couple of items? And then you go, to the, you go to the supermarket to go to buy one thing, and you come back with a shopping trolley of stuff. Sometimes my wife will send me out to go and get nappies and bread and milk. And as I'm going around, I end up buying an Xbox and I buy a new toaster. And then I buy like these trainers. And then I buy like these Pringles. And then this Coke. And then like Red Bull. And then trifles. And then yogurts and pizzas. I come back here pushing this trolley back. And she's like, I only sent you to get nappies, eggs, and milk. Why have you come back with so much stuff? And it's sometimes like that in life that we go on on our Christian journey. And all we need, look at me. He's only playing the piano. I'm sure you've seen it before. And any moment now, he's going to put his fingers on there and he's going to make some noise. Okay. It's like that sometimes in life, in our Christian journey, we can go with a shopping trolley and we pick up all of these things that we think we need for the journey of life. Well, I need that, and I need that, and I need that. What the Bible says is that his grace is sufficient. That is his grace. That's all you need. His grace is enough. The Bible says in the message version, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In fact, where you think you are weak, it is in fact where God's grace is most at work in you. His grace is sufficient. I might have weaknesses, but I know his grace is sufficient to make me stronger. His grace is sufficient. And the fifth and final point, I'm going to invite the band up tonight as we close. They can all come up together. The, great, the fifth and final point of my message tonight is this. His grace is not an excuse. His grace is an empowerment. Let me explain this because this is where some people get messed up. Some people think grace is just an excuse to go and live how you want to live. To go and do, to go and say what you want to say and live how you want to live. And what you've done is you've received the gift of grace and then you've got it and you've just let, literally smashed it against a wall. This gift that God has given you. And the grace is still there, but it is not being used for how it was given. Why would you receive such a life-saving, undeserved, unreserved, all-powerful, sufficient gift and abuse that gift? That's why Romans chapter 6 says this, Shall we go on sinning? So that grace may increase. Paul's saying, if we've got this abundance of grace, we might as well go and live how we want to live. P-A-R-T-Y tonight in Rennes. Let's do this. If the grace is there, then tomorrow morning we could all just come back down here and go, I'm sorry, I received you again. Hey, it's fine. And tomorrow night, Rennes, P-A-R-T-Y, you ain't got no alibi. You ugly. But his grace is not an excuse. His grace is an empowerment. Paul goes on to say, by no means. That is not why the grace has been given. The message version puts it like this. If we've left the country where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house? Didn't you realize that we've packed up? We've left that house for good. What Paul is saying is that grace has given you a new home. What Paul is saying is grace has given you a new seat on the plane. It is a spacious house. It is a spacious seat. It is an empowerment house. Why do you want to go back and live in your tight, claustrophobic, crammed up seat and in discomfort, being like the lady expecting stones to come your way? Jesus says to this lady, go on your way. Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you either. You see, what he's saying is the grace, the love that I'm giving you, lady, is an empowerment to your destiny. 
It's an empowerment for you to go and live. It's not simply a plaster for your cuts and something for your bruises, but it is a grace to cover, to cleanse, and to restore you. It is leading you out to a new home. Go, sin no more, get out of that. Whoever you've been caught in adultery with, say goodbye to him and enter into the new house of love and grace that I've got for you. Tonight, I want you to stand to your feet because I want you to receive the love of God afresh tonight. I want you to lift your head up and walk with your head held high. He loves you so much. God loves you before you ever loved him. And tonight, I want there to be a fresh sense of the love of God in here tonight. Just on the plane over here, I was listening to the new Hillsong Young and Free album, and maybe you've heard it. There's a song on there, my favorite song. The song's called Lifeline, track number four. I love it. I'm not a musician, but I'm there on the plane. Anyway, my favorite bit on the song is the last bit where it says, Jesus forever, you've forgiven my failures. Jesus forever, you've forgiven my failures. And as I heard it, I wrote it down because I was thinking tonight, I wanted to tell you guys at Brider that there is a man, his name is Jesus. He is here forever. And guess what? He has forgiven your failures. If we're saying tonight who's failed, hey, I'm going to be the first one down here. We've all failed, but Jesus forever, his love, his grace has forgiven my failures. And tonight, I don't know if you're a Christian or not, or maybe you've been a Christian a long time. Maybe you're just confused. You don't really know where you're at. I'm believing tonight that you'd sense the love of God afresh in your life. Maybe you've just been burnt out. You've been working hard. Maybe you're part of the brighter team, the core team, the leadership team, and you've been serving God. You've been doing lots of things for God, but you just feel distant from the love of God towards your life. I can be, I'm a pastor of a church and sometimes I, God, are you you here? God, do you love me? And do you know what? Every time I stop and every time I stand still and I say, God, I receive your love. I know I'm not leading how I should be leading. I know I'm not hitting the mark in how I should be hitting the mark, but I open my hands up. Stones probably deserve to be thrown at me, but I'm going to lift my hands up. I'm going to receive your undeserved, unreserved, all-powerful, all-sufficient, limitless grace. And the love of God just pours into my life. And from the moment I just feel a difference in my heart, it goes to my mind. It just affects my whole being. Why? Because we are built for love with Jesus Christ. And tonight I want you to close your eyes. And if you feel comfortable enough, I want you just to... Open your hands. Maybe you don't need to raise them high, but you just need to open them up like you're receiving a gift. And I'm believing tonight that there's going to be a supernatural gift that you can receive tonight. It is the love of God. His presence is here. And the band are going to sing a song. And I want you, maybe not straight away to sing it, but I want you to just receive what they're singing. And then I want you to join in. And I want you to start singing it because as you start to receive the love of God, listen to me, as you start to receive the love of God, you cannot love him back. It is impossible to receive the love of God and not love him back, not adore him back. And so I don't care how old you are tonight, how experienced you are as a Christian. I don't care if you're an elder, a deacon, a deacon elder. I don't care who you are. Tonight is for you to receive the love of God. Let's close our eyes, let's lift our hands, and let's the band just sing to us tonight as we worship him.